I'm Linda Greenhouse. I'm a member of the ACS board. I teach at Yale Law School. And it's my pleasure to introduce our lunch speaker, Harold Coe. I first didn't meet Harold Coe nearly 30 years ago when he was clerking at the Supreme Court for Justice Blackmun. And like any well-trained law clerk, he avoided making eye contact with me or with any other reporter uh, that he might see in the cafeteria line. But in the intervening decades, I've come to know him well and value and respect him highly, and it's a pleasure to introduce him today. I can tell you from personal knowledge that it's not true that Harold Coe is opposed to Mother's Day. <laughs> Many times he's wished me a happy Mother's Day. That was one of the ridiculous allegations made against him from the right when President Obama nominated him as legal advisor to the Department of State. Well, fortunately, the Senate confirmed him nonetheless. And this is a job for which Harold is superbly qualified as a leading authority on international human rights and international law generally. He's won major awards for his international human rights work. During the last three years of the Clinton administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. When not serving the government, or suing the government. He, many people remember he litigated the Haitian case, the McNary case in the early 1990s that freed Haitian refugees being detained then by the US at Guantanamo Bay. He is a professor, former dean at Yale Law School, author of 150 articles and several books, including the National Security Constitution, which won the award from the American Political Science Association as the best book published in 1991 on the American presidency. Harold is a native of Boston, graduate of Harvard College, Harvard Law School, and Oxford, which he attended as a Marshall Scholar. He's the son of Korean refugees, diplomats. His father was a diplomat and legal scholar. His mother, who's amazing, is a sociologist. Both his parents taught at Yale, and from them, I suspect, Harold inherited not only his fine scholarly mind, and his, but also his deep values, qualities that, as we know, don't always go together. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Harold Coe. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and also to Caroline Fredrickson, the ACS board and the society for your kind invitation to speak here today. What Linda didn't tell you is that uh, she is my home. <laughs> she grew up in uh, Hamden, Connecticut. I grew up in New Haven. And it wasn't till many years later when uh, I invited her to come back to Yale Law School. I told her, Linda, it's official. And she said, it's not official until I read it in the Hamden Chronicle. <laughs> uh, we became friends, uh, as she mentioned, through our common ties, not just to New Haven, but to Yale Law School and her wonderful book about my late boss, a hero to this society, Justice Harry Blackman. And uh, when I left New Haven to come here, she joined the Yale Law School faculty, and I think everyone there thinks that Yale made the better trade. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with my special assistants, uh, Kimberly Gahan and Aaron Zielinski, who are here today, trying to figure out what should be the appropriate subject of this talk. <clears throat> should it be about international law, national security law? Uh, we said, how about the ecclesiastical origins of the doctrine of pacta sunt servanda? <laughs> but I decided to give a different type of speech uh, <laughs> in Latin. Uh, <laughs> because, quote Felix Faustum Quaisit, your invitation comes to, to speak comes at a very interesting moment. Uh, like a tale of two cities, for many of you in this society, uh, this is both the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, on the one hand, the communications revolution has given you unparalleled, unparalleled access to information. On the other hand, most of it is ridiculous. <laughs> So 
So how unbelievably exciting. Every minute you get a tweet, a Facebook update, an email. The bad news, most of it is trivial. And guess what? Your inbox is full. <laughs> on the one hand, you graduated from law school. Uh, on the other hand, some of you don't have jobs. Uh, the Democrats hold the White House, a dream of the ACS. But guess what? We still have problems. After all these years, bin Laden is dead, uh, but the wars continue. And we live in a political environment where people like Don Johnson and Goodwin Liu don't get confirmed when there is no one more qualified. Now, what you might ask is wrong with this picture. In this funny time, what should you as a lawyer do? Or as I used to ask my students, how should you live your life as a lawyer? Uh, the older I get, and that's happening pretty quickly, <laughs> the more I find I need guideposts to help me answer those questions, uh, ways to think about what I'm doing, whatever job I happen to be in. And let me suggest you four guideposts that I hope will give you some reason not to be so disillusioned in these disorienting times. Uh, guidepost number one, the most simple point, uh, there is the real world, there is Washington, they are not the same thing. <laughs> no matter how many times you come here, Washington is not the real world, and life here is like life nowhere else. I know this because this is my third Washington tour, my first was in the Reagan administration in the 80s. My second in the Clinton administration in the 90s. Now I'm back in the Obama administration in the 21st century. Every time I find it exciting, but it gets more and more surreal. Because uh, this is a world where there, is no, there are no days, only legislative days. Uh, people, pretend, people pretend in this town that it doesn't matter if you shut down the government. <laughs> you turn on the TV and politicians are giving speeches to empty rooms and others are waiting in line to speak to the same <laughs> empty rooms. Just checking to make sure you're all here. <laughs> I hope you heard the laughter. There are bodies in front of me here. And now, to take it to yet another level, politicians eat tweet to you what you're, they're eating, and then people read about what they're tweeting about what they're eating. <laughs> so it's not surprising that in this town, people say things that are a little different uh, from what they do. Uh, to illustrate, when I went through my own confirmation process now more than two years ago, there was a blogger who was just furiously opposing me on the web. And at a cocktail party, I saw him. And at first, he avoided me. And then feeling very awkward, he suddenly came over and said, quoting the Godfather, <laughs> as you know, all middle-aged men of my age quote the Godfather. <laughs> he said, listen, I want you to know, it's not personal, it's business. <laughs> and then he walked away. <clears throat> <laughs> and a friend of mine said, you know, this is Washington. Don't take it personally that it's his business to attack you personally. <laughs> or another memorable moment on the day of my cloture vote. This one's really surreal. A friend of mine said, my old college roommate, a US senator, told me today he's going to support your confirmation. So the cloture vote began. I'm watching on C-SPAN, and I see the name senator come down to the Senate floor. And he lingers by the desk. And I watch with surprise, and he opposes, approaches the desk, says something to the clerk, and then they say, Senator so-and-so votes no. Who, the guy who's supposed to vote for me. Now, fortunately, I got enough votes for cloture. I was confirmed anyway. I saw my friend, and I said, hey, wasn't Senator so-and-so going to support me? Why did he vote no? And he said, Harold, don't you see? He was for you before he was against you. <laughs> if you had been about to lose, he would have voted for you. 
But he went down, found out you had enough votes, so he voted against you. <laughs> and he said it so sincerely, I said, <laughs> wow, please say thanks for me. And I hung up the phone and I said to my family, I just thanked the US Senator for voting against me. <laughs> and they said, well, Dad, welcome to Washington. Why do I say this? Because I want to say to all of you, and especially my dear friend Goodwin Liu, Washington is not the real world. Goodwin, in Washington, you're controversial. In our world, you are anything but. In our world, This is a big deal, me giving such a shout out to a Chinese guy. <laughs> I could take you back to the centuries of repression. But that is not for today. I just wanted to say, Goodwin, I would vote for you for anything, um, and you have only bright days ahead. Now, after all, I want you to remember, neither John Roberts nor Elena Kagan were confirmed to their first judicial nominations, and that's how we will remember this. And Goodwin, even if you never become a judge, doesn't every fan know it's much more fun to play the game than to be the umpire? <laughs> that's how I feel. So keep playing, you have the right stuff. Now over the years, and I say this with great sincerity, the scarcest quality in a lawyer, it's not intelligence. There are a lot of intelligent lawyers. It's not energy, it's not ambition. It is courage, courage, honesty and courage. And Goodwin Liu has those qualities in spades. That is why you are for me a symbol of this society and that's why I can't wait to see what you do next. Now, <clears throat> this is a competitive town that follows obsessively who's up and who's down. And one of the questions lurking behind that inquiry is what is the measure of your worth? What is the measure of your worth? You know, can you get a table at one of the hot restaurants in this town? Do you get invited to the correspondence dinner? But I think there is a real measure, and it is my second guidepost. In this town, you are only as good as your principles. In this town, you're only as good as your principles in two senses of that word. Your principles, P-A-L-S, the people you work for, and your principles, P-L-E-S, the values you work for, which means the measure of your worth is whether you have the right principles and whether you choose the right principles. So on the one hand, you're only as smart, able, and correct as the principles you work for, the clients and bosses you represent. The water cannot rise higher than its source. You prepare your boss and your clients for meetings, but they end up speaking for the department and for you. So in the end, you're only as good as they are. Their strengths are your strengths. Their limitations become your limitations. I learned that early in government, and <clears throat> that idea has stuck with me. Now, I am so lucky. My boss is Hillary Clinton. My client is the State Department and its many extraordinary leaders. My ultimate client is Barack Obama. These people are people whose talents are manifest whose commitments are on display every day. They are great clients, 
I chose to work for them as much as they chose me. And before I worked for the US, I worked for Yale Law School, another institution I was so proud to represent. Why do I say this? Because you choose your clients as much as they choose you, so you need to choose your clients carefully. There are some lawyers in this town who claim to follow what they call the taxi cab principle, what they call in the UK the cab rank principle, just to be different, <laughs> which means we will represent anyone who gets into our taxi cab without making any judgments about their moral rectitude. I've never liked that idea, because if one day Slobodan Milosevic or Adolf Hitler or Paul Pot tried to get into my cab, I might say, would you please take another cab? <laughs> I am not your taxi. <clears throat> I'm not your vehicle, please. I'm not saying you don't deserve representation, and I'm sure you'll find it. But why does it have to be me? I didn't train all these years and work so hard to put my talents in service of someone like you. Now, when I graduated from, my, from law school, I told my mother I was going to work for a large law firm. She said, who are your clients going to be? Here was the shocking thing. And I say to you young lawyers who go to firms, I didn't know who the clients of the firm were. I knew who the partners were. I didn't know who the clients were. I was supposed to be a smart guy, and I didn't know who the clients I was going to be working for were. But I knew a few, and I listed a Fortune 500 list, and my mother said, did they need you the most? And I said, what? Because <laughs> that was a question I had not asked. Do they need you the most? And I said, what do you mean? She said, who needs you the most? And I said, I don't know. And she said, you know, you have such privilege. We have given you such privilege. You have the most privilege. Why aren't you working for the people with the least privilege? When she was... <laughs> what she was telling me is that people judge lawyers by their clients. And the kind of lawyer you are depends less on who you work for than on what you stand for. As Linda mentioned, when I was a child, my dad served the first democratic government of South Korea. In the early 60s, it was overthrown by a military coup. My father and his closest colleagues took an oath that they would never serve the military junta. Within months, he was the only one who kept that promise. He was the only one who stuck by his principles. So he was exiled. He never served in the government again. And his former colleagues who took the pledge and broke it went on to serve in many high positions in the government. So I once asked my dad, did you regret your choice? He said, never. Those other people have high government jobs, but there will always be people who will sacrifice their principles to get a job. And I didn't want to be one of those. Then there are people who have principles stand by them, care more about their principles than their jobs, and they are there not just to be something, but to do something. And if you think about people who've served in the governments, those are the only people you ever remember. So my plea for you is to stand for something. Stand for the rule of law and the human rights principles that mark this society, that made you want to become a lawyer. As William Sloan Coffin once said, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. So live by your principles, stick by them. And if certain jobs don't come your way, then you have your principles, which were far more important in the first place. And here is my third guidepost. Life is long. Over the years, if you're lucky, like me, you get to play many roles. You get to contribute in many ways. But in each iteration, you have to understand your distinctive role. 
because different roles place very different demands on the same lawyer. To illustrate, in my own career, for more than 30 years as a lawyer, in every job I've held, I've struggled with the same question, how to promote a lawful US foreign policy. But during that time, I've served in and out of the government. I've been a professor, a human rights activist, a policymaker, and a government lawyer. So those are very different roles. And you have to understand the differences between them. Now, that's hard to do. I'm often asked, what's the difference between being legal advisor and being dean? That's easy. Money. <laughs> In this job, I ask no one for money, no one asks me for money, and I have no money. <laughs> I saw someone outside, a graduate of the school, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm following up on my pledge. I said, tell Robert Post, I said. <laughs> but the harder question is not the difference between being a government lawyer and a dean. It's What's the difference between being a government lawyer and a professor? Well, the roles are different in three senses. First, professors try to be individualists. Government lawyers are team players. Second, professors measure success by how cogently you express yourself. Government lawyers measure results, success by the results you achieve. Now, in the policy world, there are real consequences and greater uncertainty. So being wrong has real costs. And in academia, the best thing is to be original, innovative. I often go to faculty meetings where they said, he wrote an article that had a spectacularly original wrong idea. <laughs> you know, he should be made dean. <laughs> In the real world, having a spectacularly innovative wrong idea is scary. <clears throat> <laughs> so government lawyers seek to be effective by unearthing tradition and following precedent. So what does this mean for roles? Well, first, as a government lawyer, I advocate for others. As a professor, I advocate for my own position. And so my role now is fiercely advocate, honestly defend. I advocate inside the government fiercely for my preferred position. When a decision is taken, I defend it honestly. So what does this mean? As a matter of policy, I am opposed to the death penalty. I have litigated cases against the death penalty. I think it is wrong. I think it is counterproductive. But. I do not yet think, in all of its manifestations, it is illegal under international law. That day may come. I hope it does come. It hasn't come yet. So as a government lawyer, I'm constantly called in places like Geneva, New York, to defend policies of states with regard to the death penalty. And I can honestly defend the international lawfulness of policies that I would not personally advocate as a matter of human rights policy. Why? It is a different role. They don't have another lawyer who is in the position to make the defense. If I wasn't prepared to make the defense, I shouldn't have taken the job. Second, as a lawyer, I defend my client's right to choose legally available options. Now, Herman Flager, a former legal advisor, put it well. He said, never say no to your client when your law and conscience say yes, but never ever say yes when your law and conscience say no. So in the government, when a number of options are on the table, you should remove the illegal options. Say that option is not legally available, like torture. And if I have a, so if that option is put forward, you should say, 
No, it's not legally available. Not try to figure out a way to pretend that it is. But there's a flip side to this. Your client has a right to choose from the other options, even those you think are lawful, if awful. And if that's the choice they make, you have to give it your vigorous defense. Third, my personal scholarly views may differ from the starry decisis of the executive branch. My views, I have them, I had 150 articles worth in a bunch of books. But as Walter Dellinger observed when he worked at the Office of Legal Counsel, unlike an academic lawyer, an executive branch attorney has an obligation to work within a tradition of reasoned executive branch precedent memorialized in formal written opinions. Lawyers in the executive branch have thought and written for decades about the president's authorities when lawyers who are now in my office begin to research an issue, I don't expect them to turn to what I wrote or said at a law professor's convention. They look at the previous opinions of the attorney general and heads of this office to develop and refine the executive branch's legal position. Now that's not to say that one administration can't and should not reverse legal positions of another administration, but it does mean that government lawyers begin with a presumption of stare decisis, unless after careful review they think the prior interpretation is unwarranted. Now this is not surprising. After all, criminal defense lawyers or prosecutors who become judges play a different role and they approach the law from a different perspective. But I am amazed, I am amazed how few lawyers outside the government understand the three points I just made, so I will repeat them. Being a government lawyer may require you to defend human rights policy decisions you personally do not prefer. If your client chooses a legally available option, you should defend it or quit. And if your position in a government position of longstanding conflicts, you must give a presumption of deference to the government position until you follow the right procedures for getting it overturned. Now, <clears throat> this brings me to my fourth and final guide post, which is, and I speak mainly to the younger lawyers here, don't be afraid to speak up and stick by what you say. I know a professor whose student recently submitted a paper that offered a creative but edgy legal theory. The professor suggested that the student published it, but the student declined saying essentially, I don't want to leave a paper trail. Now, I understand the instincts that might lead younger lawyers to clip their own wings, but this is a bad way of living and a bad way of planning your future. In her terrific autobiography, Nancy Gertner, judge of the US District Court of Massachusetts, tells this hilarious story. She spoke on a panel with another federal judge, and law students asked them both, how do you become a judge? And the other judge answered, basically, speak carefully, show your temperate, take care not to be publicly associated with controversial causes, and if you're lucky, you'll get nominated. When they asked Judge Gertner, she said, here's how you do it. You graduate from a fine law school with a stellar record. Then you represent the first lesbian, feminist, radical, anti-Vietnam War activist accused of killing a police officer you can find. <laughs> you take every abortion case in Massachusetts. You speak on every major hot button legal issue of the day in rallies on the TV in the Boston Common represent defendants who have committed political corruption and high-profile murder, marry the legal director of the ACLU, <laughs> and then you become a federal judge. <laughs> so Nancy's point, uh, there is no right way. There is no single path to a government job. Many lawyers who were cautious their whole lives to get something never get it because of the vagaries of politics 
And when their careers ended, you remember them as timid lawyers and people who never became government officials. At the same time, there are others who live their life fully as lawyers, and sometimes they get what they want, like Nancy, against the odds. So compare my two experiences with the confirmation process. I'll be honest with you, throughout most of my early career, I played it safe. I was afraid. I wanted to preserve my options. And then, as uh, Linda mentioned, in 1991, I was called on to represent Haitian refugees on Guantanamo. So my students and I sued first President Bush, then President Clinton, and I argued the case at the Supreme Court against President Clinton in his early days at office, even though at that moment I was being considered for a job in the Clinton administration. <laughs> uh, I did not get that job. <laughs> So I took other cases. I worked for Cuban refugees on Guantanamo, even though the lawyers in that group had little to do with the lawyers who represented the other, because I concluded, like my father, maybe I'll never serve in the government, but at least I stuck by my principles. So what happened? In 1998, Madeleine Albright's chief advisor called and said, will you be the assistant secretary for human rights? I said, you know, I spent most of this last decade suing your administration. <laughs> and he said, that's why Madeline wants you. Because <laughs> you're no one's yes man. And the Cuban American community embraced me warmly. Jesse Helms swung into place behind my <laughs> nomination. <laughs> I was unanimously confirmed, and I served three happy years and exciting years as assistant secretary. Well, you know what happened after that? I took the most establishment job imaginable, dean of an Ivy League law school. Then I was nominated to be legal advisor, and suddenly I found my nomination had become controversial. Now, the most surprised person besides me was my mother, <laughs> who is sitting there listening to the fact that I'm opposed to Mother's Day. <laughs> I'm not kidding, my mother is sitting there reading, Harold Coe is opposed to Mother's Day. <laughs> and my mother said to me, what's the difference between my two sons? My brother, Howie, who is the Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services, was confirmed without even a hearing by unanimous consent. <laughs> and meanwhile, I, the bad brother, <laughs> went through an extended confirmation process. And my mother said, what's the difference between my two sons? I can think of only one. One of them is an oncologist. The other is a transnationalist. <laughs> and she said, what made the law school dean more controversial than the public health specialist? Now, at one point in my confirmation process, I met with my handlers. And one of them said, you know, you might want to apologize for some of the things you wrote. And I said to him, uh, can we get one thing straight? I'm not apologizing. I did nothing wrong. <laughs> I've lived the life I wanted to live. I've said the things I wanted to say. If you really want me to say, I'm sorry, I'll say, I'm sorry that my life's work has been misunderstood. <laughs> but at my confirmation hearing, mark my words, I want to say, on the record, I stand by every word I ever wrote, and you can look it up. That's what happened. Now, <clears throat> so what happened? I got confirmed. Uh, next week, I'll have been in this job two years. I've enjoyed it more than I can say. I head the greatest international law firm in the world. I'm proud of my principles, P-A-L-S, and I still believe in my principles, P-L-E-S. And if you're wondering, yes, confirmation is like childbirth. When it's over, you forget the hard part. You remember only the high, high points. Now, sometimes people ask me, and they usually do it at a place like this at the cocktail hour, you know, isn't it hard to be a government lawyer having to say all those things you don't believe? So my answer, and I say it to all of you, 
I never say anything I don't believe. Why should I? I have tenure. <laughs> I think. <laughs> if I quit this job, I go back to a job where I have more job security, I work less hard, and I get paid a lot more. <laughs> so I say that for this reason. If you hear me say something, you can be absolutely sure that I believe it. And that's true whether I'm speaking about the US policy toward the International Criminal Court, the legality of the administration's positions on drones, the lawfulness of the military operation against bin Laden, or the administration's position on war powers in Libya. If I say it, I believe it, and I intend to stand by it and to argue for it. Now, in this day and age, some people love to play gotcha, and it's easier for them to do so. The longer I serve in government, I get questions of the following form. You're a hypocrite, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually there's like a lead in, you know? Uh, <laughs> But that's how it ends. <laughs> you know, there's a downside to having a paper trail, which is that people who are obsessive enough can actually read it. Well, read it is a little strong. <laughs> Go through it scavenging for quote lines, and then you read a say or a blog, Co is a hypocrite, isn't he? Why? Because when he was 29 years old, he wrote this, but today, years later, he's saying that. So obviously, he has caved to political pressure. Now, this happens not all the time, but every once in a while, and my answer is always first. I think what I believe I believe. I don't think the two statements are really inconsistent. If you put the both quotes in their context, most reasonable people would see why I honestly believe what I said then and honestly believe what I say now. Most of the time, in fact, almost all the time, I see no inconsistency whatsoever. I learned this from Justice Blackman, who was frequently accused of being inconsistent over his 60-year career. And one day he said to me with a smile, Harold, some people forget life is long, and you actually learn things. <laughs> How about that? You get older, and you get wiser. And you know what? I trust my judgment now more than I did when I wrote stuff 30 years ago. So if you want the better view, I'd say trust what I'm saying now. <laughs> because it reflects a lifetime of thinking about hard problems, not a sentence I put in to complete a footnote in a tenure piece. So what I'm saying in short, <clears throat> life might be easier if you didn't have a paper trail, but on the other hand, life is too short to spend it waiting to ever say the truth. Life is too short to wait ever to speak your views. Life is too short to spend it waiting to be honest. Life is too short to keep all your heartfelt beliefs to yourself for fear that somebody might actually hear what you believe. And I say to you, it is the job of all engaged citizens, particularly members of this society, to speak up to enrich the public debate. And if people criticize you for it, that comes with the territory. If they read footnotes in your articles, that's what they now do. I would say, stick by what you say, if it represents your principles, or explain why your views honestly have evolved for the better. Now, the philosopher John Ruskin liked to say, the highest reward for a person's toil is not what he gets for it, but what he becomes by it. William Sloan Coffin said, what do you care about, having more or being more? So how to measure the value of what you do? Did you do the right thing? Did you try to make a difference? When you had to be, were you courageous? Were you always honest? Did you pick the right principles, P-A-L-S? Did you stick by your principles? Did you understand the roles you were asked to play, and when the chips were down, did you stand for something or did you stand for nothing? So that's my message in a nutshell. This may be a disorienting time, but you all came to Washington for a reason, whether you came here decades ago 
or whether you just got off the bus for this conference today, you came believing that you were coming to accomplish something. You were not just coming to hold a job. You came to serve a higher value, I thought, than your personal advancement. You came to ask what you could do for your country and for what you could do for the law. And to you, I just say this, don't stop believing. <laughs> Hold on to that feeling. <laughs> Remember why you went to law school. Remember why you joined this society. It wasn't just to get a job from a networking lunch. You joined the society because its values represented values to which you said you would be committed, that you would speak for, and that you would fight for whatever the consequences. Remember what you stand for. Don't be afraid to say it. And while Washington is not the real world, it is a fun place to spend time as a lawyer. And as Adlai Stevenson once said, when you leave here, remember why you came. Thank you.